Today we will take a look at one of South Korea's, if not the world's most notorious cases. It's not just the crime itself that makes this story both heartbreaking and tragic. In the aftermath of the case, we discovered a series of systematic failures and treatment by police that will shock you to the core and leave you questioning everything you know and trust about law enforcement in the 44 teens who violated one girl in South Korea. August 1997, and the Supreme Court of South Korea awarded 70 million won to two young girls, both victims of a crime so shocking it rocked the entire nation. The police negligence was unbelievable, and they were accused of denying the proper care of these innocent girls deserved. But more than that, careless police released the identity of one of the victims, and even blamed the girls for what had happened. In fact, had it not been for the actions of one doctor, this case may never have been heard of at all. Outrage spread as the details of the year-long ordeal was revealed, and this wasn't an isolated incident, instead of the guilty parties facing justice for the most disturbing, most vile things they did to these girls. They faced almost no consequences, and if reports are to be believed, one of the victims met their abuser in the most unlikely of ways. And by a twist of fate, this case is full of the most tragic circumstances that would not only upset you, they will anger you as it did all of South Korea at that time. So let's go back to where it all began with a phone call that will change one girl's life forever. June 2003, Olsen City, South Korea. The victim, who we only know as a 14-year-old Choi, is reported to have dialed a wrong number that led her to meet a boy from high school, who we only know as Park. They chatted for several months, and although we don't really know exactly what happened or what kind of conversation they had, we do know in January 2004, Park invited Choi to his house, and she accepted the offer she traveled to Miryang, and when she met Park, they went to his place inside Park, revealed what he really had planned for this innocent girl. Park struck Choi over the head in a vicious attack with an iron pipe. Joy was unconscious and helpless. She was taken to a motel where her nightmare would begin in the most sickening way imaginable. It was not just Park that would be in that motel room, as he had brought around another ten boys. With him, it's difficult to imagine the sheer terror Choi must have experienced as she was violated by each of the boys. And to make things worse, they even recorded it on their cell phones. They weren't just recording this to their own sordid pleasure. They were going to blackmail their victim so that they could do this to her again, and it would get a whole lot worse than that. What these boys had planned over the course of the coming months were the actions of only the sickest of minds, and Choi wasn't going to be alone in the prolonged abuse these boys were no strangers to trouble or sexual assault. They had become a real problem on the streets of South Korea and already had a history of criminal behavior that had a lot of people very worried yourself. At the time of this incident, South Korea had a huge problem with youth gangs running amok in the city, causing chaos, stealing, and even assaulting citizens. And all apparently with no remorse, the attacks have become more brutal and have begun to draw the attention of the media. It was estimated by one high school teacher that around 5% of students are affiliated with a gang that is a shocking 400 kids who at best will bully citizens, and at worst will sadly assault them, although those figures are disputed by those in charge of education. This statistic is still shocking, and in some way reflects just how widespread the problem was at the time. One of the major problem is the civil violence these kids can inflict on others. They are known for extortion, intimidation, robbery, and more between 2001 and 2003 rapes that were committed by boys in high school tripled. Often their days are spent ordering young kids to take money from even younger kids to fuel their lifestyle of alcohol. And girls. A notable incident happened, and when a young girl was dragged against her will into a secluded area where a gang and degraded her and filmed the whole thing on cell phones, they threatened to bury her alive to the point where she believed them and thought she was going to die. The victim lived to tell the tale, but was left with psychological damage that needed professional help. Experts have claimed issues ranging from violent video games to insufficient parental care being the cause of this rising problems. To me, they can have anonymity by using the sheer number of members and youth gangs to hide their individual identity. And even if they did get caught, the punishment was often light, if any at all, the South Korean government and police force were so concerned, they offered amnesty to students who turned themselves in for crimes promising light punishment. In a move that thousands took advantage of, they threatened to share the videos they had filmed if Choi did not do as they wanted. And so began a long, painful year for Choi, who was made to do whatever these boys wanted. She no doubt felt trapped and unable to talk to anyone. Choi was violated around nine more times, and this could happen anywhere, even outdoors the boys did this just for fun, or at least to them they were entertained at Choi's suffering, 
and the assaults would get worse as time went on, it is believed she was violated by over 40 boys in that year, with over 20 boys at a time reported to have been involved. It's difficult to imagine how soul-destroying this must have been for Choi, as her attackers took pleasure from her pain and showed no signs of stopping. But they weren't just satisfied with one girl, and soon they would order Choi to bring more girls along, and they wanted her 16-year-old cousin and 13-year-old sister. Her cousin was also raped while her younger sister was assaulted. In all this time, it's reported that some of the videos were shared online for the world to see in another heartbreaking twist. But where were Choi's parents in all of this? Surely anyone's father or mother would realize something is wrong. She must have had a change in behavior and become more isolated, as many do, who have suffered the same fate as it turns out her parents wouldn't be any help at all. Choi's mother had fled from the family home. The reason Choi's father was an alcoholic, not only did he not care about his daughter, he was beating her much, like the gang was leaving her nowhere to turn at the most desperate of times. As it all became too much for Choi to handle, he took measures into her own hands in a last-ditch attempt to end the year-long ordeal. Joy took a large amount of sleeping pills in an effort to take her own life. Thankfully, she was found before it was too late and was taken to the hospital for recovery. Has she not taken the pills, it's possible her ordeal would never have come to light. It's thanks to the doctor who treated her that enabled a family member to finally step in and take action. She was examined after the doctor saw the suspicious marks on her body, and the doctor's worst fears were realized when her aunt found out she contacted the police that was November 25, 2004. Just short of a year since she picked up the phone and called the wrong number that would begin this nightmare. Police began an immediate investigation, and they found more victims of the gang. At least five other girls are suspected to have fallen victim to the same group of boys. This should have been where Choi's pain and suffering finally ended. Evidence was there to prove what had happened, and the boys were now known to police. The guilty parties should have been facing some very tough questions, and the possibility of severe punishment, especially when the media got hold of the story which, as you can imagine, caused a national outrage. The problem of youth gangs was highlighted with this case, and the public not only wanted answers, they wanted justice for those affected by their crimes. But unbelievably, things would only get worse for the victims, as what the police did next will anger and shock you. We have seen failures by authorities to protect the victims of crimes all across the world. But in the case of Choi and the other victims, the sheer negligence and lack of care shown by officers must have been one of the worst failures of all. The girls were treated by police as guilty, with officers reportedly accusing them of bringing it on to themselves. One senior officer is accused of telling one or more of the girls, weren't you girls waving your ass around and kept going there because you liked it? My hometown is Mir Yang, and you've destroyed the reputation of the town. It's so hard to imagine such neglect would come from someone who's supposed to be there to protect those in the community, but things would not get any better. Choi was made to point out her abusers in a lineup at the police station, but it wasn't a dark room or a two-way mirror. Officers would actually march her into a room and ask her to point out the boys who did this to her. This was in a well-lit room and must have been almost overwhelming for Choi, who eventually pointed out the guilty boys. She was even taken into a room with each boy where the officer would ask them if they had assaulted her. In fact, there was no attempt to hide her identity from the accused, leaving her wide open to intimidation, which began not long after she left the station. She was threatened when walking outside and is believed one of the girls actually quit school. As the intimidation she was receiving was just too much for her, even their request to speak to a female officer was denied with claims that they were simply not enough female officers experienced enough to handle this kind of case. The insensitivity shown towards the victims is just shocking. The negligence shown belongs nowhere in the modern world as we as people should be above this kind of behavior, especially when young kids like these have their innocence ripped from them by such uncaring savages that negligence extended to the police press release with the claim that Troy's sister has also been simply assaulted when in fact she had been beaten. This left her sister open to the intimidation that her two relatives have been exposed to this case has sparked controversy across South Korea, but the outrage was fueled even further when the public found found out how the victims have been dealt with by the police around 150 people attended a visual for the victims in protest of their treatment as more and more details emerged on the case and specifically how the girls were treated. The more the story spread, the case hit the headlines after the police investigation led them to an internet cafe where around 40 boys were arrested. Up until this point, Choi and her cousin had been belittled by those who were supposed to protect her. The police placed the blame firmly on their shoulders, and Choi's father was just as judgmental. 
but now with the public behind the campaign to bring justice for those affected and punish those responsible. Choi and her cousin had voices to speak on their behalf, and those voices were getting louder. There was anger over how the victims were left unprotected, or worse their identities were allowed to be leaked to the accused and the media. Originally, the police arrested three people on December 8, 2004, and a further nine were arrested on December 11th after pressure from the public 29 of the boys were booked without detention, but the police claimed somewhat inaccurately among the 41 boys. We have arrested 17 boys who directly participated in the school assault, and we are still tracking down the 75 people who have not yet been brought in for questioning police later issued an apology for refusing the request to speak to a female officer, but by this point it seemed too little too late speculation on who the suspects were peaked with the justice-hungry public, and details of those who may have been responsible leaked on the internet leading to possible repercussions. The biggest problem was that some of the information was wrong, meaning innocent young men had sensitive information poured out online. Thankfully, none of the falsely accused came to harm. The police released a statement that explained they would change the investigating team and look further into all of the allegations made. Perhaps one of the most tragic parts of this crime is not the crime itself, but the aftermath of this entire year-long ordeal left on these poor young girls whose innocence and childhood was snatched away by this group of unhinged young men. Joy had been physically and mentally scarred after what she had been subjected to. Her body needed medical attention and time to heal, but the psychological damage was much more extensive. She was treated in a closed psychiatric ward where experts could try to help her overcome her experiences. And as if Choi had not been through enough at this point, things would only get worse when her alcoholic father visited her bedside and brought along some of the boy's parents. Why would he do this money? He had brought them along to convince Choi to settle for 50 million won. And even worse, she was pushed into signing a statement in which she asked for leniency against the accused boys. Imagine how Choi must have felt having gone through this terrifying, brutal ordeal only to be made to sign her name on a piece of paper that would possibly help get her attackers off lightly. So what happened to the settlement money? Instead of it being used to help with Choi's medical treatment or help her to start afresh, it was taken by her family despite the tragedy of the last year of her life. Choi was determined to finish school, but this itself brought its own share of problems. The South Korean society was not favorable towards victims. She did find a school that would take her, but even then she was hounded by the parents of the guilty boys to sign a petition asking for their parole. The boys themselves faced sentences that only added insult to injury. Most went to juvenile court, and only 10 faced actual criminal charges. Those facing jail time would only serve a maximum of four years. But unsurprisingly, even those 10 were let off and sent to juvenile court. One problem was with a settlement her father had made her sign. This did not reflect well on the justice system, and in the end, only five were sent to a detention center. Not one of those boys who subjected Choi to the most horrifying year anyone could even live through was even convicted, despite the constant failures of the justice system. Many in the media spoke out against the culture of sex in Korea. Reforms did eventually come. In the years since this case, Korea had made sweeping changes in its justice system that were aimed at helping to protect the most vulnerable in cases like these. South Korea was not long after these crimes listed as 117 out of 142 in gender equality by the World Economic Forum. A shocking statistic for such a developed country of worldwide influence over the years, much have been done to change the justice system and bring fair treatment for all, regardless of gender, 